Hello chess fans, welcome to Chess Openings Explained. I'm your instructor tonight, Nick Risco. I'm one of the instructors here at the Chess Club. And tonight we're gonna to be going over uh, the Owens defense. It's a 1b6 after 1e4. And I think this is probably the first opening where I can say that big names have played these lines. Names like Nakamura, Gureyev, Rajabov, Ivanchuk, Amon Hamilton, uh, even uh, Ali Reza Faruja plays some of these lines that we're going to cover tonight. Uh, so hopefully this will give a lot of good ideas to everybody watching tonight. Uh, I think there's some really cool ideas to be learned from both sides. Uh, so like I said, the opening starts after 1e4 and then pawn to b6. And this does not follow, you know, most popular opening principles. Um, Black is not trying to go and claim space in the center right away. They're not even trying to go with knight f6 claiming the center. Uh, so 1b6, what exactly is Black trying to do? Well, very clearly they're setting up a fianchetto for the light squared bishop to maybe control this diagonal, put some pressure on e4 later in the future. And then only later, after seeing what White's setup is, Black is going to decide what structure is going to be best for them. Uh, so here, uh, white should play pawn to d4. Now I know when we were talking about the Nimzovich defense a few weeks ago, uh, I said, you know, don't play d4, but uh, the difference is that here in the Owens defense, e5 is not a move uh, that black should be able to get away with, um, making white commit to a structure that's worse for them. Uh, they should just be able to push or take the pawn. So after pawn to d4, you know, your opponent gives you space in the center, might as well take it. We see black play bishop to b7. Uh, this is just the move every player who plays the own defense plays, um, just getting that fianchetto taken care of early. And here we reach the first position where white has a decision. Uh, there are a few moves here. We will start off with probably the second most popular knight to c3. Uh, on the previous move, black has attacked the e4 pawn, so white just wants to defend. And instead of playing pawn to f3, which can get in the way of your knight and your queen, uh, white's just going to go knight to c3 and protect with the knight. Uh, a fine move. And from here, black normally plays... Whoa, where'd it go? <laughs> black normally plays pawn to e6. Probably going for an eventual d5 push where the bishop will help support. Uh, and also stopping white from playing pawn to d5, gaining space. And here there are two moves by white. One that uh, looks natural, the other one not so much. So we will start with the one that doesn't look so natural, but players should still be aware of, is that white can play pawn to a3. And one of the ideas of this is just to stop the bishop from coming and pinning the knight. Uh, because once, you know, if black plays a bishop to b4, this knight is going to no longer be protecting our pawn on e4 and become a weakness. So that is why you may see white play a3 here. Black is going to follow up by putting pressure on e4. White is just going to defend. And pawn c5. We see a break with this pawn trying to chip away at the center. White can now go knight f3. Uh, and this is fine. We didn't put the bish or we didn't put the pawn on f3, blocking the knight, and the knight will protect d4. Uh, you may see a trade on d4 followed by knight c6. White can just trade knights and enjoy a slightly better position after e5, where they will have a space advantage. It's going to be pretty hard for Black just to kind of push and break through past this e5 pawn. You see, like knight to d5, and instead of trading. With a space advantage, you don't want to trade off pieces. Uh, you can just go knight to e4, and it's going to be looking to probably land on d6 in the future. And this line was featured in uh, Prada Scarmoile in a correspondence game all the way back in 1989. So one of the older lines from tonight. But back to this position after pawn to e6, we're going to start seeing some more names we're familiar with. We're going to go down a couple lines that... Nakamura and Gureyev and Rajabov and Ivanchuk have played, uh, starting with knight to f3. This one seems much more natural. You might see a lot of probably scholastic players be playing moves like this. The e4, d4, 
knight c3 and f3 because this is probably the ideal setup. The knights just go to their natural squares, they support the center, and you'll be seeing moves like uh, bishop 2, c4, maybe bishop e3 or f4, depending on what the position demands. You will normally see the bishop come to b4. This was the idea that a3 was trying to stop in our previous line. Uh, you'll see white go bishop d3. This is completely fine. Uh, again, you know, with, with this pin, the knight is no longer going to be supporting the e4 pawn, so we do have to reinforce it. But this comes with us developing our bishop with white being able to castle on the next move. You'll see knight f6 putting more pressure on. Now, again, don't be fooled. This is not a protected pawn. The knight is not actually defending. Pinned pieces do not protect. <laughs> the defense of a pinned piece is only imaginary. So here, you have to play queen e2. That way, uh, your queen will protect the pawn on e4. So just don't get caught up in you know, the quickness of your development. You do need to make sure you are maintaining your pawn center. After queen to e2, Black normally plays pawn to d5. This was another idea that we were talking about earlier. Again, putting another attacker on e4. And this is trying to force white to make a decision on how they are going to handle their center. Uh, one idea is just trading on d5. You can open up the position like this after knight takes. You have to go bishop d2 to support the knight enough without needing to... Uh, give up a pawn or even an exchange if you're not careful. So bishop to d2, knight c3, and pawn takes c3. This bishop is good enough on this diagonal here. Uh, if you take on c3, this offers black the chance to trade, uh, and there really doesn't seem to be a reason to give away one of your bishops um, this early in the game. It might be more beneficial to keep it on the board and see what potential this bishop holds in the future. So we take with the pawn forcing the bishop to move back. It normally goes to e7, um, keeping an eye on this g5 square. We do have a knight and a bishop on that square. And now we see castles from both sides. This position should be pretty balanced. But one move that is seems to be very popular at the top level is pawn to e5. Um, I don't know why I have a dubious mark on that. Um, let me remove that real quick. Uh, I don't think I can say it's dubious if the world's best players are playing it. Uh, maybe I, I uh, had the intention of putting interesting move. Uh, but here, after pawn to e5, there is knight to e4. The knight just comes in. You have to be very aggressive. You don't just want to go back to d7. It might be a bit tricky to get your knight to c6 and off of c6 to play c5 in the future. Um, and it's really hard to tell where this knight is going. Uh, it could go to f8 and g6, but it's a very long plan. It's much better just to be aggressive, put that knight on e4, and uh, watch white play bishop to d2. Um, bishop to d2 is a good move. Uh, I do want to mention castles, and this is the move that uh, like Nakamura, Rajabov have played. Um, so castles, and we see knight takes c3, pawn takes c3, bishop takes c3, and we realize that white is sacrificing a pawn here. They sacrifice their b pawn, they're going to play rook to b1, and this can lead to a very, I guess, unclear position. You can see this idea of a sacrifice in many lines where, uh, you know, black is going to play e6 and d5, this pawn sacrifice uh, does pop up. I believe there's also a very similar sacrifice in the Tarash variation of the French that we looked at last week. So for those of you who are who have been watching the Openings Explained series might be familiar with this idea already. Uh, so that was e5 and then after knight e4, bishop d2, knight takes d2, we see queen takes d2. Um, you might be thinking why are you putting your queen in the way of your king with this bishop here? As long as you don't move this knight, you're going to be just fine. Uh, you're going to castle um, and then play like a3 to kick the bishop out. Uh, one of the many possible continuations here for black, uh, this is where it kind of branches out, but one that I thought was uh, really interesting was pawn to c5. Looking like you're trapping the bishop, 
Uh, so if white plays pawn to a3, they can't really go back to a5. I, I guess it's possible. Um, but black is probably going to be better off trading the bishop for the knight because with all the pawns on the dark squares here, it's hard to see any hope for that bishop. Uh, and this position should also be pretty balanced. Okay, so let's go back. Uh, that covers the uh, knight c3 ideas. So those are like the main ideas for white. I do want to cover some of the other third move alternatives. I guess there's one other big one. And this is actually a move that uh, our very own Jonathan Schrantz has covered recently with um, the nasal wasp gambit, which is bishop to g5. And the idea is you're gambiting your e-pawn. And what, what is the purpose of this? Why is white just giving away a center pawn for what seems like no compensation? There's this very interesting idea that was brought up of pawn to d5. And now the bishop cannot go back to b7 where it wants to be. It wants to be on this very long diagonal. But after pawn to d5, this bishop is going to have to settle with the b1 to h7 diagonal. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. It's just black needs to keep that in mind. Uh, it will not be able to go back to where it came from. The most popular continuation is pawn to h6 and bishop to h4, just moving the bishop out of danger. Bishop's going to come to g3 after we see pawn to g5. Now here, the most, sorry, the most natural move might be bishop to g3. You know, bishop's attacked, you got to move it out of danger. Makes a lot of sense. But there is the alternative knight to c3, which is actually slightly better. Uh, if you go bishop g3 right away, black does have this line where they can get a little bit of an advantage. Um, so here after bishop g7, if we see knight to c3 first, then black can take double white's pawns, play knight f6 hitting the d5 pawn, white is forced to play c4 to hold on, and pawn to d6, white's pawn structure is a little messy on the queen side, um, so there are going to be weaknesses there for black to hit in the future. This knight can go to a6 or d7 to c5, get a nice outpost, because there are no b or d pawns to kick it away. So um, to avoid this bit of a messy structure, you will see white go knight c3 first. And the idea is if black takes your bishop on h4, the knight is going to take on e4. And here, black has the doubled pawns on the rook file, which in an end game probably are not going to be the most useful. Uh, and this knight is on e4 in the center with nothing there to really attack it right away. It should be noted f5 cannot be played to attack the knight because of queen h5 mate. Uh, so here after knight c3, you will normally see the bishop go back to g6. And here, now white will move the bishop to g3. Uh, and the big difference here is just that black has not had the time to play bishop to g7, so they cannot take the knight and force the doubling of the pawns. After bishop to g7, you will see knight to f3, and here if they take on c3, it's not going to be as bad. Black doesn't seem to have the activity that they do with the bishop on e4, because now after knight to f6, um, you have bishop d3 offering to trade the bishops right away, which is possible. Um, you have h4 trying to chip away at the king side, uh, because the queen is the only defender that you need on this pawn. You don't need to play c4 to hold on to it right here. So white still retains that, um, that tempo. They're not forced to play c4. Um, and that looks to be most of the theory on the nasal loss gambit. Uh, it is still relatively unknown, so it's not like there's a whole bunch of theory out there to look at it. Um, but yes, everyone should be aware of this move if they're wanting to play the Owens defense as black. Those are the two major third move alternatives. So bishop g5, the nasal loss gambit we just looked at, and earlier we looked at knight to c3. So both of these are very good third move alternatives, worth a shot for white. But the main move we're going to look at is bishop to d3. 
This is probably the most flexible move for white. It leaves this knight open to go to f3 or e2. Uh, it's allowed to go to e2 because we've already developed the bishop. And then this knight on b1 can go to c3 or d2, depending on if we want to uh, support our center with c3, if the position demands. Uh, and here, black does have a few alternatives. So the first move here by black, which I, I just want to point out because it has been played before, is just flat out losing, is pawn to f5. Uh, this is the Metovinsky gambit, and if white is not prepared, they, they do have some problems. But here you can just learn the refutation to it and never have to worry about complicated positions. Um, with this, uh, I wouldn't say it's easy to find over the board, um, but it, it makes sense after you see the line. We first start off with pawn taking. If it's a gambit, we can accept. And now bishop takes g2. This is the idea. They are attacking the rook and trying to win a rook. Here in the position, white has this move, queen to h5 check, which gives the compensation for this rook that they are uh, looking to give up. Pawn to g6 is the only move here. There's nowhere for the king to move. And now we have pawn takes g6. We are threatening pawn to g7 or pawn h7 mate. So here, black does have to do something about it. And there are a few different moves here. I think the first one I have on my list is bishop to g7. It's probably the only real try. If they take the rook, again, g7 mate, uh, they can try knight f6. Uh, and here we get into uh, g takes h7 check. And then after the knight takes the queen, you have bishop to g6 mate. And this is actually a miniature given by Greco. So those who are familiar with Greco, I believe he's an Italian composer. Uh, this came from an example given in 1620. So if you thought that you know the 1900s were old for correspondence games, we're seeing examples from the 1600s here tonight. So they can't go knight f6. The only try for black is to go bishop to g7. And here, white should just take on h7 with check. The king is forced to go to f8. And the key move here is knight to f3. And after every response, white is looking at a crushing attack. So we will start with, what if the bishop takes on h1? This is what black was wanting all along when they offered the gambit. White can follow up with knight to e5. And now if bishop takes e5, d e5, and here you are going to be uh, pretty fine after something like queen over to f5 check. Uh, here white can, or this is black's move. Black almost has to give up the rook uh, and the bishop can take. If they don't give up the rook, if they make some move like bishop d5, then you can take on g8 making a queen. And then if rook takes, bishop h6 is going to lead to mate in four. And then if king takes, it's going to be mate in seven after queen g6 with very similar ideas of bringing the bishop into h6. And if rook takes, then queen takes, king f7, and queen h7, um, this is mate in three after like king e8, bishop g6, you're, you're checkmating here. Um, but it, it shouldn't be too hard to find those mate in threes over the board. You just need to get to the position where they exist. Um, so if they don't take on h1, let's say they go knight f6 attacking the queen. You have to remember to go queen to g6, getting the queen out of danger. You're also hitting the bishop. So now it makes sense for the bishop to take on h1. There is bishop to h6 looking to take on g7 with the queen, um, take on h8 after and just clear out the king side here for black. The rook is known to take on h7. Uh, there's also bishop takes h6, which is losing queen h6, king f7, knight g5, leads to mate in one with bishop to g6. Uh, so rook h7, knight to g5, you're threatening mate in one with the queen. 
with the knight supporting. You're also threatening to take on h7. Here, if queen e8, then knight h7 with check, and here is mate in one with queen to g7. This was played in the game Harib Nasser versus Ahmed in 2019. Um, so yes, these positions are from games. Uh, a better try is bishop takes h6, but this is also forced mate in seven after knight takes h7, knight takes h7, and you have to remember queen takes h6 check. If you don't remember this move, it's just going to be an equal position. King has to go to f7, queen h7 check. King e6 is going to be the best continuation for black with mate in four, and uh, the solution here is queen g6, king d5, knight c3 check, getting some of our final pieces in the attack. Uh, and it looks like he might be escaping after king takes d4, but there is this move, queen to g5, which leads to mate in one after every black response with um, the move queen to e3. So there really is no good way for black to survive after pawn to f5. You may still see it as a trick in blitz tournaments, but you should be prepared now uh, after your opponent plays f5. Okay, so no pawn f5, just given the refutation. The other move by black, um, they can play g6, but this will lead to a hippo. Uh, and that has uh, different ideas than the Owens defense, so I'm not going to cover it. The hippo is going to be a setup for black with bishop to g7. You're going to play pawns to e6 and d6 and the knights to the center. Um, but like I said, we're not going to cover that tonight. The ideas are uh, different. So I guess that leaves the only good option uh, for black, if they're not wanting to play the main line, is pawn to d6. And after pawn to d6, uh, yes, they can still transpose to a hippo after a couple moves, but uh, there actually is a line here which isn't a hippo they can play. So after a move like knight f3, knight to d7, white can castle, and black has been trying to play e5 instead of e6. So this knight is supporting. And this is where we get that idea of pawn to c3. So this is one of those positions where uh, you know, we're like, okay, good, we didn't play knight c3 because now we can support our center with a pawn. Now if they capture, we can recapture with pawn, and then we have a 2 on one in the center. So that being said, black doesn't normally take here. They just continue developing with knight g2 f6, getting ready to go bishop e7, castle, put pressure in the center. White should reinforce their center. It is being attacked by two pieces. So rook to e1, and now pawn to g6. Um, the bishop is going to look to go to g7 now, add more pressure to d4. Um, but here white has this very interesting move, bishop to g5, where after bishop to g5, this knight is pinned, so it can't really move out of the way for the bishop to put pressure on d4. Um, it makes it a little bit tough for black just to maneuver their pieces. So you'll see them play h6, trying to kick the bishop away. Bishop to h4, maintaining the pin, and now after g5, bishop g3. White's going to have a little bit of trouble getting this bishop active, but with you know these trades in the center, it shouldn't be too terribly difficult. Um, the threat is going to be when black plays pawn to h5, looking to play pawn to h4. So here... White has to play h4 themselves, so black cannot play it. If they try and go h3, pawn to h4 is still going to be good for black. You retreat the bishop to h2, and now pawn g4, you're looking to just give up this pawn, trade it off to open up lines for your position. And here, black does have some, some uh, pressure here on the king side. The queen can't come in right away because of the knight on f3 but that's going to be some of the ideas black has here. Uh, so that's why white needs to play h4, just so black can never play it themselves. And now you'll see pawn to g4, and then knight f to d2 after bringing it back. White does have a bit of a comfortable position after stopping this attack. And here, um, computer evaluations are giving it about plus one. 
So pawn to d6 is another idea. Again, very sharp with these kingside pawn pushes. If white is not prepared, they can fall into trouble very quick. OK, bishop d3. Now we're going to look at the main line here. We have pawn to e6. So we just looked at pawn to d6. g6 transposes to a hippo. Uh, we're going to be looking at e6 now. And after e6, white, uh, again, has, uh, I guess it's just one main move here. They do have many moves. They can play c3. They can go uh, a3 like before, just avoiding any bishop b4 in the future. Um, but the most popular move here is knight to f3. And black has decisions now. There's three moves here played by very big names. Uh, oops, I actually uh, messed up my notes here. There's one main move uh, with a couple variations inside of it. Um, pawn to d5. And this is a move that has been played by Ali Reza Feruja and Hikaru Nakamura. Uh, so they play pawn to d5 here. White will normally play pawn to e5, closing up the center, just saying, hey, black, uh, you, you blocked in your bishop here. Uh, and here uh, we see a split between what the two very strong players play. Hikaru has played pawn to c5 multiple times here, where white just defends the pawn with a pawn, as we've seen before. Knight develops to e7. And here uh, Nakamura has played queen to c8 as well, um, instead of just knight to e7. Uh, white's fine after castle, bishop a6. Um, but c4 is going to be a move that uh, really helps them fight in the center. Uh, knight e7 to help support. And then knight c3, white does have a comfortable lead here. Um, and then, again, after knight e7, just castles. White's going to be fine with this space advantage. Um, Sandro Schock is saying in the comments, it looks like the Tarash, uh, that line we just looked at with uh, c4. And yeah, there are a lot of captures here with these pawns here on the c and d files. Um, it does resemble a Tarash system. Uh, let's see, instead of c5, uh, Nakamura plays it. I can't bash on it too much. Uh, like I said, white does have a uh, comfortable advantage. Um, and I think Kakaro has been playing it against uh, players much lower rated. I could be wrong on that, but uh, it does exist. Uh, the other move that exists, the move that Feruja has played before, is bishop to a6. And it looks like black is going for a trade on a6, just getting uh, white's light square bishop off the board, which can be beneficial for black because white's pawns are on the dark colored squares. But with uh, this space advantage, white uh, is okay making this trade. The knight is a little misplaced. Black's going to have to give a little bit of work, a little bit of effort to reroute this knight to a better square. You'll see like pawn to c3, just building up a huge pawn chain. Queen to d7, maybe looking to castle queen side. Um, not entirely clear. Uh, white can castle king side. You'll see pawn to c5. And uh, pawn to a3 leads to a bit of an unclear position. This is also a line that um, Amon Hamilton has played with the black pieces. OK, a lot of options here for both sides. So e6, knight f3. But the main move here is c5, challenging in the center right away. Pawn to c5 is striking at d4. It is protected by the knight. The question is if white has to do anything about this or if they can let it, uh, if they can let it sit. Um, here, there is a, not really a transposition, but a way to kind of get out of some of these big space French-like positions, I guess like French advance. Um, for white, if white castles here, it can lead to a lot of Sicilian-like positions after pawn takes, knight takes. Uh, you'll see this starts to resemble, you know, open c file. Uh, the d pawn is missing. Knight is on d4. You see knight to c6. There can be a trade. Knight to c3 and bishop to c5. Uh, and this is um, almost like an e6 Sicilian with uh, b6 and bishop b7 played. 
Um, so yeah, white can play castles there if they are comfortable with open Sicilian positions. It's going to resemble those. Um, the other option they have is just support the pawn with c3 again. Uh, if black takes, just recapture with your c-pawn. And this is a line that black has played before in a couple games, but doesn't really work out too well for them. After white takes back with c4, or I guess with the c-pawn on d4, there are two moves black has played in the past. We'll start with knight f6, putting pressure on the e-pawn. White just defends with the knight, and bishop to b4 pinning. So again, like we've seen in some of the earlier variations, the defense with a pinned piece is but imaginary. So this knight's not helping out. You have to play queen e2 to defend your center. Pawn to d5. Pawn to e5, closing up the center again. And knight to e4. So this is a maneuver that we've seen before. We get castles from white, and we get another chance for a pawn sacrifice here if black takes on c3, rook b1, staring on this half-open b-file. Uh, this is also supposed to be very good for white. I'm not too familiar why this position is considered winning for white. Engine's giving it plus 2.5, uh, or plus 2.7, depending on how long you let it think. Um, so I'm not exactly sure what the difference is between this position and the previous position where there was this sacrifice. But in this variation, let it be known that you shouldn't take on c3. Uh, you should just go bishop to e7. White is still going to be better here, uh, plus 1, 1.7 here. Um, so not the best black can get with the Owens defense, but white should still be prepared if they face this uh, knight of 6 move. The other move that black has is bishop to b4 check, and this is a bit more of an aggressive option here, just coming for the king right away. Knight to c3 can lead to transpositions to the other lines with um, the bishop coming to b4 and pinning the knight. It's just we're getting there in a different move order. We get knight f6, queen e2, uh, pawn d5, e5, knight e4, castles, bishop c3. Uh, a little bit different. If the knight takes, we end up in the same position that we just looked at, uh, where like knight c6 can be played and bishop a3 stopping black from castling. Otherwise, um, black can take on c3 first uh, with the bishop, and then after pawn takes, the knight can take. We see queen to e3, queen's attacked, we have to do something about it. We castle, and here, White has a Greek gift sacrifice that will help them win the game. Bishop takes h7 check. This position is already plus four, um, plus five now. Um, king takes h7, knight to g5 check. For those familiar with this trap, this isn't going to be new to you guys. And we see queen to h3 looking to go to h7. Best move for black is check, king h1, um, but now, uh, in order to stop the checkmate, uh, rook e8 isn't going to work. After queen h7, king f8, there's bishop a3, which gets rid of the escape square. You have to block, so like giving up the queen, or if you try blocking with the queen on e7, just queen h8 is mate. So uh, there are opportunities for white to have a Greek gift sacrifice as well. Okay, um, so taking on c or sorry, taking on d4 with the c pawn is possible. I cannot recommend it for black. Uh, have not seen a line where black equalizes. Uh, with that being said, uh, black should play knight to f6 in this position. Leave the pawn tension. There's absolutely no reason to get rid of it prematurely. You don't want to take and give up tension unless there is a very good reason for it. Okay, knight f6. What does white do after knight f6? Well, they're putting pressure on our e4 pawn. Bishop and knight are attacking. So we have to defend. Now here, there are two options. You can go queen e2 or you can go knight d2, but I have to recommend queen to e2. We have not developed the dark square bishop yet, so I, I can't recommend knight d2. 
because this knight cannot easily move away. This pawn is going to be facing pressure until you play e5, but when you play e5, you give up a little bit of the space control, um, where here you are controlling two squares, three with uh, the pawn on d4. When you play pawn to e5, you're still controlling e5, but it's because it's occupied, uh, which makes this pawn on d4, um, I guess, less flexible in how you're handling anything happening in the center. Uh, with knight d2, like I said, can't really move easily, and it's going to be tough to get the dark square bishop out. So just go queen e2. This dark square bishop's going to get out to f4, g5, maybe e3. Um, you know, the, the opportunity for that is going to be low with the pressure on e4. But uh, you, you want to re, uh, retain maximum flexibility for your pieces. So queen e2, recommended move here. Bishop to e7. Don't really want to put it on d6. You don't want to block your center pawn from advancing. Uh, and here, uh, white just does have the tactic pawn to e5. So if you are developing, you just have to go to e7. This is OK. You're preventing any pins on g5 from the bishop. Uh, I guess black also has a couple other moves here. Uh, instead of bishop e7, it looks like there is the move pawn to d5 right away. So as I was mentioning, you don't want to block the pawn. You do want to advance it in the future. You can play d5 here, uh, running into pawn e5. Uh, you have to push it because now there's three attackers, and you don't want to play knight d2 defending blocking your bishop. So it's best just to move it out of the way. You have to make this, uh, this advance. Uh, you do get this open diagonal, uh, though. Knight f to d7. Bishop g5, getting the dark square bishop out with tempo. Black just blocks. And here, uh, you know, where, where does white's bishop want to go? Does it really want to go back behind its own pawn? Does it want to go to e3 and block, block the queen from getting out in the future? You can't really put it on d2. That's where your knight wants to go. And it, it would look almost silly to put it back on c1 just because you're undeveloping. So you'll see white exchange here. Queen takes, castles from white, knight c6 first, putting pressure on the center before castles. And here, uh, I believe I have it marked as a novelty. Uh, I couldn't find the game with this played. Queen to e3, just supporting the center. And white should be comfortable here. No significant advantage. It's not like there's any crazy kingside attacks here. Uh, but white should just stand a little bit better. Okay, uh, the other move they have, which I've marked as a mistake, instead of bishop e7, is knight to c6. And the reason this is a mistake is because now white can start pushing pawns in the center and get their pawns rolling. Pawn to d5 is going to attack the knight, it's attacking the center. Uh, if black takes, this is a big problem. After e takes d5, there's this check on the king. Sure, you can block with the queen, but uh, you're going to lose a knight in the process. If you block with the knight, well, white just pushes pawn to d6, and they are winning a piece. So knight to c6, uh, if you have the white pieces, just be aware you can get the pawns going. Uh, if they have not castled yet, there are some discoveries. Okay, back to bishop e7. We looked at the alternatives here. Bishop e7 probably gives the most promising position for the player with the black pieces. And here, oops, looks like I moved the page. Okay, here is where I have my personal disagreements with what the main line is. Um, the main line here, white castles. Uh, let's see. Yes, uh, white castles here. This is the main line. I can't say anything is wrong with this. Uh, it's been tried and tested, scores great. Uh, here you will see knight to c6, putting more pressure on d4, and you'll get pawn to a3. And this is just, you don't want black to take and then play a knight to b4. Um, there are ideas where after takes, takes, the pawn is no longer protecting b4, so the knight will come trying to attack the bishop. a3 is stopping this idea. And then you'll see uh, knight to a5 looking to come to b3. So knight to, to d2 here, 
Uh, you do block your bishop, but it is to stop this um, attack on the rook, uh, protecting against this uh, forking idea. Pawn to c4, attacking the bishop, and bishop just drops back to c2. There is the move takes with the knight, uh, and after knight takes, bishop takes, and bishop takes e4. This is still okay for white. I don't recommend it. You're giving up a centered pawn, um, and I, I don't like the idea that we are uh, just giving that up for the c pawn. Um, so bishop to c2 instead, just uh, keeping everything solid. And now something like queen c7, uh, protecting the pawn. Rook to e1, castles. Rook to b1, probably looking to go b4. Rook a to e8. Um, honestly, this move is a little beyond me. I'm not entirely sure why it's this rook coming all the way over. I'm assuming it's just there's no like way black can push through on the queen side and get this rook active. So they bring it to the center looking for uh, if white plays d5, they trade and they have a rook on a, a file, or they may be trying to push themselves. Um, and if anyone has any knowledge in that position, feel free to drop it in the comments. Knight to f1 here, rerouting the knight, pawn to d6, uh, prepping maybe e5. Uh, knight to g3, this is like a maneuver that we've seen in the Rui Lopez, the Italian, uh, very classical knight maneuver. And now pawn to e5 by black. And white has uh, a healthy advantage here. Um, some moves they can play is like pawn to h3, there's bishop to e3, many, many moves that lead to a fine position. And this was from the game Sermek Filipovic, where white won in 1999. However, I said I can't, uh, can't always agree with the main line. I feel like there is a better move than castles here. And I'm giving that move an exclamation mark, uh, pawn to e5. I really like aggressive openings. I feel playing e5 is the most aggressive approach. I'm gonna go for e5. After e5, black does have to move the knight. They can't just let it sit and hang. They cannot really take on f3 because after bishop takes f3, uh, they can't just leave this knight here um, and they can't really just move it to h5 because of something like queen takes a8. So they would still have to go knight d5, and it's, you know, you don't want to give up your pieces uh, prematurely. You want to make sure you're making the most of your pieces all the time. And this bishop does look better than this knight. So here, knight to d5 uh, should be played. And now we have this move, pawn to c4, attacking the knight again being very aggressive. The knight has two squares it can go to. It can go to c7, uh, and then white will get knight to c3. Uh, and here you may see black capture, because here there is cd4, and if the queen, I mean, like the queen can't take, it's protected by the knight. So um, black is gonna get the center pawn here. So um, taking should be fine for black here. Um, so knight c7 is worth a try. If black is trying to be aggressive and go knight to b4, then I feel bishop to e4 is a good move for white, trying to trade off the light square bishops. Uh, queen to c7, defending. You don't really want white to take here because after bishop takes, queen takes. Uh, if you try and take on d4 and give up the rook, uh, you're going to fall just a little short. Uh, knight c2 is going to try and win it back. But after king e2, knight takes e1, uh, the knight is looking a little trapped after queen e4. It's uh, not easy to see how the knight is going to get out. And ideally, white is going to win that knight in the future. We see a uh, Greg Contalini bringing in a Ben Feingold reference here. Uh, c4 is explosive, definitely trying. Uh, so yes, bishop e4 looking to trade, queen c7 because you don't want to, to get your knight trapped in the corner forever. And here, we're going to continue being aggressive. We're going to go pawn a3, attack the knight again. And here, there, there's really, it's really tough to find a correct move for white, uh, but bringing the knight back to c6 
Going to probably have to be the best try. But now, pawn to d5. The pawns keep rolling. If knight takes e5, uh, you know, you can sacrifice um, this pawn, give it up. Just go knight c3 after takes. Uh, probably bishop takes. Um, here, I found uh, even though white is down a pawn, massive activity with the pieces is coming. The bishop is going to come in, have a purpose. Uh, white's going to castle. It's just all the pieces are doing things. Um, and here, I think the move that I have, which is testing for black, if they're not going to retreat the knight, um, one other try is bishop takes e4, and this should be losing for black after queen takes e4, queen c6, you know, a way to protect the rook is just by putting a piece in the way. And now, instead of trading queens, you don't want to trade queens, the knight can recapture, this is equal. Um, just queen e2. Protect against the knight check. The knight has to go back to a6 now. Both sides castle. And knight c3, and white is better here. Uh, position is plus 2. The knights are developed. The bishop is going to come out when it's ready. Um, get the rooks to the center. This pawn center is ready to get rolling. This position is really great. This has not been played... Um, in any games that I know of. This was a, a line that I found from messing around with the engine while preparing for this, uh, for this lecture. Originally, I was going to just say, you know, castles, main line, play it, it's great. Still great, um, but I did find that this line with um, pawn to e5 just being very aggressive uh, and rather forcing does lead to very great chances for white. And I wanted to make sure that uh, that was out there and people could see it. So uh, this line does exist. Uh, but that is all the theory I have prepared for you guys tonight. Uh, and just like last time, we're going to open up the last 10 to 15 minutes here to any questions in the chat. We do have a lot of people in the chat uh, compared to last week. So let's start scrolling through, see if there's any questions about our opening. Is the Owens defense even good in classical games? My opinion is that if you're below uh, over the board rating of 2,000, your openings, uh, while it's good to have a plan, are not crucial because people blunder. Um, you know, at the amateur level, everyone blunders. You know, if you're rated 1,500 and you never blunder, why are you rated 1,500? Um, so everyone blunders at some points. You're going to end up leaving theory and people have chances to make mistakes. So. Uh, for the amateur, I, I think I can say yes, the Owens defense is good. You might end up in some tough positions where you're going to have to fight a little bit um, against White's space and some of their activity, but it should be playable. And I, I can't say it's not playable because you have very strong grandmasters playing both sides of this opening. So I can't say that uh, it's horrible in classical games, though there is the opinion that it, uh, the Owens is a, a bad defense, as, as claimed by Ghana in the chat. Um, I, I can't say it's complete garbage. I, I think it's almost losing by force, but not quite. There are lines where black does have a, a very solid fight. Um, so, yes, I think uh, Surreal is also saying uh, something along the lines like, this isn't a super serious opening that black plays. Uh, yeah, this is not the most popular opening from black, but it's very good to at least study it as white, know what you're getting into. Uh, very similar to the Alakine defense where people are like, oh, it's not a major opening, don't need to study it. You should always go through and study it anyway because you don't want to get into this situation where you don't treat it seriously because you assume it's horrible and then you know, start losing the game just because you're overconfident. You want to make sure you still have that plan of what you are doing. Um, so that's, that's probably my opinions on, on the Owens defense right there. Uh, let's see, what else is in the chat? Uh, we're seeing stuff about the Benoni and the Benko Gambit. It's not this opening, so I'm not going to answer questions about those. Uh, let's see, I guess there was a, a debate in the chat on 
why the Owens is good or, or bad. Uh, see the Scandinavian coming up. We see the Blackmar Deemer Gambit showing up. Uh, and the Levitsky attack. Those are openings that are in the works right now. Uh, Sandro Shock is asking about pinning the F6 Knight, also an option. There is no move number. So I don't exactly know where to look. So Sandro, if you want that question answered, please include a move number so I know what line you're talking about. I'm Annie's asking if the Owens defense is approved in classical games from Super GMs. Um, I, I don't remember if they were classical games or if they were Blitz and Rapid, but yes, the Owens has been played um, by Super GMs with the black pieces. Uh, again, Hikaru Nakamura, and Alareza Ferruja have lines that we've covered. Uh, doo -doo -doo. So, yes, more people asking, is this played in the GM levels? Yes, Grandmasters do play this opening. Um, there are games by famous players in this opening. Uh, but I'm done saying that, so I'm, I'm going to stop saying it. Um, doesn't look like there are any other questions about the Owens. Uh, George Lethbridge is asking, would this be advisable for a 1B3 player? Uh, I do like the question. So let's go back to the uh, opening position here on our board. Um, 1B6 and 1B3 may have very similar ideas in the fact that your bishop is going to be going uh, to uh, Fianchetto itself. Um, I, I don't know how similar they are beyond that because I know that black can have some very aggressive setups with e5, d6, and f5, whereas here with the Owens, there aren't many lines where we're going to be seeing white play pawn to f4. I'm sure they exist. I'm not saying they don't exist. I'm not saying that those lines are bad for white. I'm just saying those were not the lines that I prepared tonight. Um, so it could be advisable, I think, um, though... The, the problem is going to come down to who has the first move. So white can uh, play b3 and get away with some of this uh, bit of slower development in the center because they have this first move advantage. Black does not have that luxury of the first move advantage and is always going to feel that half tempo uh, down, uh, behind. Um, so they're going to be playing catch up in the center. As we saw, uh, black was always preparing e5 they're always preparing d5 it's not like they can just play it right away so uh you know if you're a 1b3 player i'd say try it out but i don't think you can be as aggressive as you would be uh with any b3 lines all right back to the chat let's see Talking about other crazy openings here. Uh, Sandro Schock was talking about it was the line where e4 was hanging and the options were between knight e2 and knight bd2. Okay, I, I'll come back to that. I'll see if I can find it. Um, Paco Zambellini is saying if you play e6 first as black, it's a French defense, not an Owen, so it's better, question mark. Uh... Yeah, if you play e6 first, so e4 and pawn e6, uh, that is a French. But in the French, you're not typically going to see a pawn to b6 and the, the bishop fianchetto. Um, in the French defense, you're going to see more e6 and d5 in a direct fight for the center. It's not going to have the same fianchetto ideas um, that the Owens defense features. Though I know there are some sidelines in the French that feature this idea, but... Uh, I think that even, you know, e6 after you play b6 um, is going to be uh, way different than a French. Uh, because you might see pawn to d6. It's not guaranteed they're going to go pawn to d5. Okay. Um, Owens defense or Owens gambit? It was an overall view of the Owens defense. 800 rating, beginner, intermediate. Not related to openings, but 800 rating, typically beginner. Um, say like 1200 and up is going to be more of your intermediate level crowd uh, and we get Paco's question again okay so Sandro Shock I'm going to try and find that line 
with knight to d2. We'll see if I can find it here. Because there were a lot of moments where the pawn on e4 was under attack. I'll see if I can find it, but no guarantees. Why can't I find it? Oh, here it is. Okay. So this is in the main line on move five where uh, black goes c5 right away. And then they go knight f6 and they're attacking the pawn. Sandra Schock is asking about bishop to g5 here. And I don't see any problems with this move. This move, you're still developing your piece, you're, you're pinning. So yes, this pin is another way to defend your e4 pawn. The critical try for black is going to be playing pawn to h6, and here the only thing white can do to, to be better is take on f6. So as long as you have the idea of playing bishop to g5 to trade on f6, yeah, go ahead and do it. Um, but this is what happens if you know white does not uh, trade. If they go bishop to h4, because black has not castled kingside, Playing moves like g5 should not be out of the question. White should always be looking at this. Um, because the king can castle queenside if it needs to. It, it can stay in the center. It hasn't castled to the king side where pushing g5 is going to be a big weakness. And after pawn to g5, after bishop to g3, e4 does hang. So you'll see something like knight takes e4. And if you trade the bishop for the knight, uh, engine saying this is equal. I think it's going to be a little difficult for white being a pawn down, especially with CD looking like it can be played. Um, but the, the, the upside here for white is that white does have the development of the knight and bishop, and black does have a lot of extended pawns. They have not taken the time to develop their pieces off of the back rank, so, so that's where the upside is going to be if you're not taking on f6. So very good question from Sandro Schock here. Uh, bishop g5, a fine move. I just think you can get better, more active positions after queen e2. Okay, back to the chat. See if there's any more questions. Is Karo Khan stronger than the Owens? I have to say yes. Karo Khan, probably much stronger, only because it's making that direct fight for control in the center. I know Caleb Denby's done a series on the Karo Khan on our YouTube channel, so check that out when you have the chance. Okay, uh, how can I become Grandmaster? You just got to get good. Got to get good at chess. Um, get a rating over 2,500. Get norms, all good stuff. Um, I'm at 1,450 tips to get better. These aren't opening questions, but I figured I'll answer them. Uh, at 1,450 tips to get better, just do your tactics. Just grind tactics on Lee Chess or chess.com uh, and do your end game studies. Surreal is saying this is a bad defense for black. I have to agree, it's, it's not the best defense for black. Um, but it, it is a very strong, uh, not strong, uh, but it is a very serious sideline that white players need to look at. Unless you're rated over 3,000, uh, it's going to be worth taking a look at this opening at least. Uh, Paco, no problem. Uh, I'm always happy to answer the questions. Uh, but yeah, here we are wrapping up at the end of the half hour. Going to uh 20 seconds for any last minute questions here. Otherwise, we are going to wrap it up. You guys are welcome for the lecture. It's always a pleasure doing it. It's always great when the chat is interacting. Um, See, we're getting some requests for the King's Gambit. We do have a lot of openings that uh, I'm working on for this lecture series. Uh, so we are going to try and get a taste of everything. But if there is something specific you want to see, make sure you drop it in the comments section below once this stream is up on YouTube. I'm always checking the comments on the videos to see what people are recommending. And that is going to be the uh, best way to make sure that I see it. Uh, if you're interested in lessons, we do have instructors on our web page. Uh, I just see some people thinking about getting lessons. We do have instructors on our web page that uh, cover more than just openings. Um, 
seeing more more opening suggestions. I love to see it. This is the end of our uh, our hour long lecture though, so we do have to go. Again, if you have openings you want to see, drop them in the comments section below. Uh, it was a very fun time giving this lecture. We're going to go over to our Twitch channel where we're doing tactics. I will see you guys over there. Thanks for stopping in.